If you know me at all, been around me for very long, you know that I love God's Word. But there was a time where it was just a book. A book, and I used to say silly things like, oh, it was just a book written by men. It's no big deal. Can't trust it. Blah, blah, blah. God obviously did something in me and changed me. And he's communicated some things to me that have, have been burned into my d- spiritual DNA. That I, as I grow and understand God's word, it becomes more and more beautiful, more and more powerful, more and more just awe-inspiring. And we're going to get into a text today that is one of those texts that if you if you have an open heart, when you read through this and study through this, it should just blow you away. We're going we're gonna to take, we're still in our series, Last Days Living, but we're going to take a break out of the book of Revelation. So turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at a text out of the Old Testament book of Daniel, there is, you know, we're at that point in the study of Revelation, we finished chapter 5 last time, and we're getting ready to start chapter 6, we'll do that, Lord willing, next weekend, and chapter 6 is the beginning of a section of the book of Revelation that relates to a time where some pretty dramatic things are taking place on the earth. In fact, what it is, and and one of the primary things we see, is that God is judging the world starting in Revelation chapter 6. Let's pray, and then we'll get into our text for this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time, this opportunity to get into your word. And Lord, as has been prayed already several times today, Lord, we recognize that this weekend, as a country, we pause, and for those that are... are, um, aware, Lord, uh, we realize that this is, a, uh, in some respects, a somber day, a day that we, we pause to remember that, that the freedoms that we enjoy in this country were not free. They came at a great cost. And Lord, um, and those, uh, those that are spiritually awake, we realize the connection between that and the price that was paid that we might be free from the consequence and penalty of sin when Jesus died for us. So we, we take that seriously and we thank you for this opportunity to gather even, even on a weekend like this while others are away and, 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 and remembering those things in whatever way that they choose to. We thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to do it here. And as we get into this text and see the marvel of your word, Lord God, I pray that you would uh, open our hearts to hear and receive from you what you have for your church. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Title of this morning's message is Jacob's Trouble. God created everything. It's one of our foundational beliefs. God created everything, and He created it for His purposes and for His glory. That's why everything exists. It exists to glorify God and to accomplish His purposes in the world. God also directed to us and communicated to us what those purposes are and how it is that he wants us to live in this world. God commanded our ancient ancestors, Adam and Eve, he commanded them to live in fellowship with him, commanded them to, and gave them the perfect place to do it and said, Obey me, walk with me, live with me, love me, and live in paradise forever. He also told them, disobey me, and death is the consequence. And separation from me is the consequence. Promise them great blessing. Promise them beauty. Promise them fullness. Promise them just the, just the greatest possible life that would, would have gone on forever and ever and ever if they would just obey. God always keeps his word. 
always. If God says it, he does it. God said, if you disobey me, there is a consequence. If you obey me, there's a consequence too. If you obey me, there's a consequence of blessing and reward. If you disobey me, there's also a a consequence. And it is typically unpleasant. For millennia, that means thousands of years, people have been rebelling against God. They have been disobeying God. They have been doing what they want to do, choosing their way to live, choosing to live exactly the way they want to in direct opposition to the clear description of God's will. And God said, if you do that, there will be a consequence. And he told us what the consequence was, that he would pour out his wrath upon this world. He told us that. He said, it will happen. And so for thousands of years, God has been patiently tolerating mankind's sin. Tolerating it. And some, arrogantly or ignorantly, view God's patience as his not caring about sin. God cares. And he said, I'm going to do something about the sin of this world. There is going to be a day. There is going to be a price. There is going to be a consequence. There is going to be something that will happen because of the sin. He cares. And because he cares, he will deal with it. In 2 Peter 3.9, he said this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. It means he's not lazy. He's not, he's not just not going to do something about it, but is long suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire for us, for all of mankind, is that we would come to repentance, that we would realize, okay, I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God, and I need to step away from that. I have to stop choosing my way and choose God's way. I have to stop rebelling, disobeying God, and I have to walk in fellowship with Him. He wants us to turn away. He wants not just us. He wants the whole world to do that. So One of the reasons why we're going to see these things that are described in chap- starting in chapter 6 next week. One of the purposes, one of the two primary purposes of this period of time that we're going to, we're going to read about in chapter 6 through 18 specifically is to judge the world for its sin, of its rebellion against God, for its, its determined purpose to resist and to walk a different way. The second purpose of of this period of time has to do with another promise that God made. In Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 14, it said this, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. God entered into an eternal covenant with Abram, Abraham, ultimately he would be called. An eternal covenant and his descendants. These descendants would later be known as the Jews a people group that still exists to this day. After thousands of years, they still exist. Elsewhere, God said that as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are in the heavens, so long will his covenant be with the people of Israel, with the Jews, that it was not going to end, that God had determined that they would be his people. He chose them, not because they were good, not because they were special, not because they were better than anybody else. In fact, they were not better than anybody else, but because he chose them as an act of grace, his grace. And much like he offered to Adam and Eve a choice, obey me and live, disobey me and die. He offered to the people of Israel the same thing. He offered them a choice. He said, walk with me. Worship me and me alone and live. Live in the land in prosperity, protected from your enemies forever. 
He promised to take care of them and to flourish them and to make them huge in the eyes of the rest of the world. Disobey me, he said, and there will be a consequence. And one of the consequences that God said they should expect is that if they chose to worship anything else or rebelled against him, turned away from him, that he would kick them out of the land that he promised to give them forever. And that's exactly what God did. He warned them and warned them and warned them for hundreds of years, he warned them. And said, if you do not turn from your wickedness, I will kick you out of the land. And he wasn't vague about about the warning. The warnings were clear. If you do not turn, there is a consequence coming. That's exactly what God did about 70 years before the text we're going to look at here this morning. At the time that that Daniel wrote chapter 9, he is one of the exiles in Babylon. He was in the city of Jerusalem as a young man in 605, approximately 605 B.C. We don't know for certain how old he was, probably in his early teens, mid-teens maybe, 15, 16 years old when he was, when he was carried away to Babylon. There he became one of the most important people in the, in the entire nation of Babylon. In that city, he became very important in the kingdom of Babylon, rose up to great power. And God used him in remarkable and amazing ways during that time. Let's pick it up. Let's look at uh, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. We want to look at this text here today. Some cool stuff in here. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azurus or whatever, yeah, of the lineage of the Medes who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, there's just just so much just cool stuff wrapped up in that. Here's Daniel, very important man, very successful, and here he is reading the Old Testament, not what we call them the Old Testament scrolls, they are the, the, the scrolls of the prophets. And here he's, he's in the scroll of Jeremiah, reading it, and he comes to this, this text and turn to Jeremiah 25. We'll look at what he was actually reading in Jeremiah 25, what he read when he, when he came to this, this revelation that, um, that he came to, Revelation chapter 25. He comes across this prophecy that is of particular interest to himself and to his people. In Jeremiah 25, starting in verse 11, it says this, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass, when 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. That prophecy was written about 20 years before the exile began. Jeremiah was was prophesying and and speaking to the nation of Judah and uh, in in around the city of Jerusalem about 20 years before and, and during the exile, during much of that period. And he said, there's going to be 70 years, 70 years where you're going to be in exile. And at the end of that 70 years, I will punish the king of Babylon. Well, Darius, where we read back, we'll go ahead and turn back to Daniel chapter 9. Darius is of the Medes. They had come in and conquered the, the nation of Babylon. And so as Daniel's reading this, he sees that, that there were 70 years that they, were, that they were going to be in this exile. At the end of that 70 years, God was going to deal with the, the Babylonians and then also that he was going to cause the people to return to the land. Radical promise there in that. As he's reading this, he's understanding that, 
God is going to do something. Daniel is a man of faith. We see that as you read through the book of Daniel, you see that over and over again. He's a man of faith. He, he's also a man of the word. As he's reading through the Bible, he sees this, this prophecy, and he believed it. Why? Why? What outside evidence was there that God was going to keep his word here? You know, as, as we read things like this, we sometimes read over and say, yeah, okay, but yeah, we, we, we know it because we look backward at it. We know, yeah, of course, he, he believed it because it was going to happen, but he didn't know that. He just believed it was going to happen. And here's what we need to get from that. God's word is truth. Every word of it. When God caused it to be written in the book, it became fact. It became real. It became what was going to happen. The future was determined when God wrote it in this book. When God said to the prophet Jeremiah, 70 years, it became a fact. Even though it hadn't happened yet, it became fact. And what we need to get from that is that is what, what Daniel did here, and what we need to learn to do is take God's word at face value. You know, I, I heard a commentator say, you know, believe the naked truth of God's word. Just what it is. But that's not what we do. You know, typically we read it, and then we put a comma and a but. God's word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But, and then we, we say something else. I, I, I care for you. He says, you know, Peter says, cast all your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. But, I have this need that's not fulfilled yet. I have this desire. I have, you know, this is going on. We, we add to God's word these things that deny the power of God's word. And what we need to start doing, if we want to truly be able to be men of faith like Daniel's a man of faith, is stop butting God's word out of the way. Put a period at the end of God's word. An exclamation point at the end of God's word. Don't put question marks. Don't put commas. Put a period at the end of it and say, this is what God's word says, and I believe it. Even if I can't see it being fulfilled in my life. Daniel couldn't see the end. He couldn't see that, that not too long after he, he got to this place, that in fact, the first wave of exiles would be sent back, be allowed to go back to Jerusalem. Right now, as he's reading this, Jerusalem has been a desolation for 70 years. A wasteland. City is burned with fire. The temple was destroyed and stripped. He just believed. He counted off the years and said, wow, we're like, we're like right there. It could be any minute. And then he prays this prayer. Let's get down to verse 13. Let me go ahead and read this out because it's just fascinating how he prays here. As it is written in the law of Moses, again, he, he, he's going back to the word of God. All this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God. He says, all this disaster has come upon us just like the word of God said it was going to. Moses said in the the book of Deuteronomy and other books, he says, if you forsake me, I will will kick you out of the land. Not only the 70 years is also interesting. Why did God pick 70 years? Because one of the things that's in the book of of Moses, in the the books of Moses, is that they were supposed to let the land rest every seven years. They were to plant crops and harvest them for six years, and on the seventh year, they were to leave the land alone, let it rest for for the seventh year. And God promised, if you do that, I will bless your crops so much in the sixth year, you won't even worry about the crops of the seventh year. But they didn't do it. You know for how long? 490 years. So God said, okay, I'll get my Sabbath year. And for every Sabbath year that you missed, you'll be in exile. Seventy years. God's word is always true. He counts off those years, realizes it, says, okay, you're going to do that. He says, 
We have not made our prayer before the Lord our God. We haven't even repented. After 70 years, we still haven't repented, he says, that we, may, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth, understand your word, understand that the Bible is always, always truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, God keeping his word, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does. He always does what he says, though we have not obeyed your voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, you've done these amazing, amazing things in the past, and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Daniel, which may, at that point in history, might have been the most righteous man in all of the nation of Israel, says, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. Too often our prayers, we are pointing out at others and their wickedness and not remembering that, you know, that we ought to probably deal with the plank in our own eye before we start pointing out at other people's sin. O Lord, verse 16, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because uh, for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication. For the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, because of your great mercies. And I don't come to you based on our righteousness because we have none. I come based on your mercies. When you pray to God, you don't pray based on your goodness, your, the things you've done. Don't do that because you've got nothing to bring. You pray upon his mercies. You call, you call upon his grace. You call upon his righteousness, his goodness, because that's the basis that we approach God, not based on our own. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. He calls upon God to do what he promised. Amazing. As, as Daniel comes and he humbles himself before God and calls out to God and prays to God, God answers Daniel in a spectacular way. Verse 20. Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision of the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Daniel read God's word and believed it. He believed. And his first response was to pray. Was to pray in faith, believing that God's word would be true, that it is truth, and it was going to come to pass. And so he prayed that way. Brothers and sisters, this is how we need to approach God's word. If we approach God's word, we read God's word, we read it and say, oh, okay, that's, that, that's, that's truth. I then pray that prayer according to truth and calling upon God to be true to his word, which he always is, which challenges me to be true to God. But as I do that, God answers. He answers. He sends Gabriel to, to respond to Daniel's prayers because Daniel believed the word of God and prayed the word of God. Oh, it's so, um, so much that we can glean from that, we can draw from that. If we will just trust God, take him at his word, his bare word, stop adding to it, stop, stop trying to, to make it something that it's not. Trying to, not, stop trying to justify why we can't believe what God says, just believe it. And then pray like you believe it. And then expect God to answer. Expect it. 
God sends Gabriel. Gabriel, we, we see him regularly, not too regularly, I guess. We see him a few times in scriptures, one of three angels that are named, him and Michael and, and Lucifer. Gabriel, we saw another place. We see him in the New Testament. Zach, he shows up to Zacharias. John the Baptist's father. And then he shows up again with the maiden Mary and tells her about the miracle that God is going to do in her in bringing forth the Christ. And he has here, Gabriel has a special message for Daniel, verse 22. <clears throat> and he, Gabriel, informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. You know, I want you to understand something. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, you've got to remember that in, in context, what we're, what we're understand something is that that Daniel's people are the Jews, and they are in exile right now. The city is Jerusalem, and it is a wasteland. It is not really a city. It is just ruins. It had been ruins for 70 years. You leave a place without attention for 70 years in a place like that, you wouldn't even recognize it when you went back. 70 weeks, it says in our translations, most of our translations. The literal translation of that 70 weeks is 70 sevens. 70 sevens. The context, again, Daniel is thinking about the 70 years of the exile. And so we recognize what he's saying here. There are 70 sets of seven years determined for your people in the city of Jerusalem, 70 times 7 for you math wizards is 490 years. 490 years is determined for your people. Based on the Babylonian calendar, which was the calendar that they would have been using there, based on 360-day calendar, a 360-day year, comes to a total of 173,880 days. Memorize that number, it's important. No, you don't have to memorize it. I'm going to keep saying it because I've memorized it. <laughs> there are some things in the Bible that are so remarkable that if you, can, if you can look at it and not be absolutely staggered by the power of it, then there's a problem in your faith, a serious problem in your faith, which probably could be that you don't actually have any. One of the keys to understanding the book of Revelation, especially this part that we're going to look at right here, has to do with what we find here in this verse and the next couple of verses. 490 years are determined for your people and the holy city, the city of Jerusalem. The 490 years have to do with the Jews and Jerusalem. Verse 24, continuing. This is what the, what's going to be accomplished in those 70 uh, weeks. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconcile, reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. What that's referring to, we don't have time to unwrap all of that. That's pointing to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The purpose of these 70 weeks that Daniel's referring to is to usher in and bring in the 70 weeks at the end of it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand, because he's going to talk about what these 70 weeks, how to, how to understand them, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And to me, this is where this gets really fascinating. 
Daniel's given a very specific understanding, a, a starting point of the first 69 sets of seven years. The first 69 sets of seven years, 483 years. He says it has to do with this command to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. From that point, something was going to happen. You count off 483 years from that point using a Babylonian calendar and you'll be able to figure out what it is. Now, now, Gabriel's, as Gabriel's speaking to Daniel, it's about probably 536 B.C., right in that general area. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And it's not until another 70 years later, approximately. 90 years later, excuse me. 90 years later that God puts a burden on one man's heart. Nehemiah. You guys have probably read the account of Nehemiah, the men's ministry, the men's retreat. That was, the, that, was our, that was our theme for the men's retreat. Nehemiah is the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, the king of the Persian Empire at that time. He ruled the whole world at that point. The Jews have been back in the land of Israel for about 90 years. And yet the city was still in ruins. And Nehemiah gets this burden upon his heart and hears that the city is still in ruins, that the wall is broken down, and he and he just something something moves in him, and it's obviously the Spirit of God moving in him, and he's compelled to do something about it. And so he gets permission and gets a, a, a letters, a decree to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. He begins with a wall, and then they go to the houses, and they rebuild the city of Jerusalem. The date is March, approximately 445 B.C. They actually have an exact, they, they, they believe there's an exact date that you can point to. Then you start counting the 69 weeks, which is the 69 weeks is the 1,703 173,880 days. You count them off. And it comes to a very specific event. Something was going to happen in verse 26. After, excuse me, to restore the Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Messiah is what they've been waiting for. He says that from that 173,888 days, Messiah the Prince will come. And how will you know him? In Zechariah 9, 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Does that sound familiar to anyone? There was a point where Jesus told his disciples to go get a donkey, the foal of a donkey, had never been ridden. And he got onto that donkey, and they led him into the city of Jerusalem. You remember the people, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were proclaiming him the Messiah as he's being led into the city in, in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Exactly. 173,880 days after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Exactly 173,880 days. Exactly. God's word is always truth. Always. And it should fill us with awe when we read things like that. That God predicted in advance. As a matter of fact, one of the things that God says, especially in the book of Isaiah, he says, uh, just so that you know that I'm God, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. So that when it happens, you won't give credit to one of your gods, one of your false gods, one of your idols. You'll know that it was me speaking. Only God can do that. Only God can tell us the future. 
because he's the only one that is there. You know, God lives in the future and in the past and in the present all at the same time. You know how he does that? Somebody shake your head. No. No. He's, yeah. I don't know how he does it. I just know that he does because, well, he is God. So God does what he wants. Gabriel continues because there's more to understand. The, the, the 69, the, the 7 and 62 weeks, the first, seven, the first part of, this, of the 70 weeks, 70 sets of 7, ended when Jesus walked in to Jerusalem or rode into Jerusalem on, the, on that donkey. That was the end of the 69th week. There's still one week left. There's still one week of the 77s that still has to be fulfilled. Verse 26, it says this, and then after the 62 weeks, there was first seven first and then 62. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. That term cut off means he will be killed. Not die, he will be killed. But not for himself. He won't die because he's evil. He won't die because he's a criminal. He won't die uh, not for himself. He died an atoning death. Romans 5.8 God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another event's going to happen after that. Uh, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood till the end, till the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And you notice he says that, there, that the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. At the time that it was written, there was no city and there was no sanctuary, implying that, you know, that, that this is going to be rebuilt. The sanctuary will be rebuilt, and it was rebuilt. When, when the first wave in, they, they, they did eventually rebuild the sanctuary. They rebuilt the wall. They rebuilt the city, and it stood all the way until the time that Jesus came. And in fact, right before Jesus got there, Herod rebuilt, I mean, added to and embellished upon and, and improved the temple until it was this magnificent, magnificent structure. And so from the time, all that time, the temple is there, the city is there, it's growing, it's flourishing, it's become beautiful. But after the Messiah is cut off, after Jesus died on the cross, there was going to come a people who would Utterly and totally destroyed. And we know in 70 AD, the Roman Empire under, under the, the general Titus came in and did that very thing. And it was ap an absolute massacre. They said there were so many crosses where they crucified people, they ran out of wood to crucify people. Acres and acres. Everywhere you could see thousands of people killed. And the temple has been down and destroyed ever since. They're ready to rebuild it. Some of, the, some of you that went to Israel here recently probably saw some of that, maybe some of the information about that. I just heard a message on it just this morning, as a matter of fact, that the temple will be rebuilt. And they're preparing for that right now. And if I just heard something interesting, that they, they're using science, genetics, to identify the Levitical priests, the descendants of Aaron, so they can know exactly who the descendants of Aaron are so that they can pick a true high priest so that they can reinitiate the temple sacrifices once they have permission to rebuild their temple. And they're ready to do it right now. 62 weeks until after the 62 weeks, there's just one week left. In 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed and has been destroyed ever since. And it was destroyed by the, print, the people of the prince to come. The prince to come is not the Messiah. It is another person that we'll get into once we get in further into the book of Revelation. A person that we refer to as the Antichrist. He will come onto the scene in human history when, when all the world is in chaos. I believe it'll, he'll come because that in an instant, millions of Christians 
will just suddenly vanish. And it will leave a wake of chaos in the world that this world has never seen before. And sometime after that, a great war is going to take place around Israel. We call it the Gog and Magog War. It will take place in which all of God's enemies will come against the nation of Israel and God will destroy them supernaturally. And after that will come this man. Out of the ashes of this, of this chaos will come and represent himself as the Savior of the world. And the world will follow him. And one of the things he'll do to influence people is found here in the next verse. Then he, this prince who shall come, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. The Antichrist, one of the things he's going to do, he's going to bring about a treaty between the nation of Israel and all of her enemies. All of those who would come against her, he's going, he's going to develop this, this treaty, this covenant that brings a, a, a type of peace. I'm going to tell you next week why it's kind of a weird piece, but it's a, it's, a, it's a treaty where Israel is at some level of peace with her enemies. And one of, the, one of the aspects of that covenant is that treaty is that they have permission to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. Today, if they even suggested it, it would cause all sorts of trouble. The Arab world would explode if they ever tried to do it. But he's going to do what at this point seems impossible. He's going to allow them to rebuild it, and they will return to their ancient worship of God with the temple sacrifices and the altar and the priesthood and all of that stuff will be re reinitiated, which is tragic and sad on so many levels because it will be, they will be all excited and they will believe that somehow it's making them right with God, but it will be absolutely empty and meaningless because God says that all religion apart from Jesus Christ is useless and pointless, is vanity. And they will enjoy this level of peace for a time. Verse 27 continuing, but... In the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven years, he, this, this prince to come, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Notice that they are sacrificing and offering again. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In the middle of the 70th week, in the middle of this week in which the prince to come, the Antichrist, establishes this treaty, in the middle of it, he's going to break the treaty himself. He's going to come in, they've got their temple, and they're worshiping, and they've got the Holy of Holies. You know, I, I have a question mark about the Ark of the Covenant, but maybe they'll find it. Maybe they'll re I don't know what they'll do, but he's going to go into the Holy of Holies and set up an image to himself and demand that the whole world worship him as God. The abomination that causes desolation. Jesus told the Jews of his time, uh, if you see that, you better run. Don't go into the house and get a coat. Don't, don't, don't hesitate. You just got to run as fast as you can. And the Bible makes it clear to us that it will be a time of absolute terror upon the people of Jews, uh, people of Israel, because the Antichrist will wage all-out war on them. And a high percentage, two-thirds of them, will die very shortly after he wages war upon them. Daniel even tells us a little bit later how long after this event, after the Antichrist stands up in front of in the Holy of Holies, demands to be worshipped as God. He tells us how long it will be from that point till the time that Jesus comes. Daniel 12, 11 says this, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, from that time, there shall be 1,290 days. 1,290. 
290 days. If you do the math there, it comes to three and a half years. All of God's Word flows together. And as we read through it, we're going to talk about this. We go through chapters 6 through 19. We'll start it next week. What, we're, what those chapters are, are a detailed description of this, of this 70th week. It tells us what is, t- what, is, what is practically, materially going to happen during that 70th week. Jeremiah calls it elsewhere the time of Jacob's trouble. While one of the purposes of the tribulation is to judge the world for its wickedness and rebellion against God, the other purpose is to do a work in the people of God, the Jews, his chosen people. He's going to redeem his people. There's going to come a time. There's going to come a time where the Jews wake up to the reality that the Messiah that they've been waiting for for thousands of years is, in fact, Jesus Christ. And they're going to look upon him. It tells us in Zechariah 12.10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, the Messiah, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The second purpose of this period that we will refer to and and label as the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year period which God's doing this work in the world to judge the world for its wickedness, also to redeem his people back to himself, to keep his promise to Abraham and to all of his descendants throughout time, to keep his word, to bring them back to himself during that time He's going to do this work also in the world. 70th week, the 69th week of Daniel ended in approximately, in about April 33 AD. It's been almost 2,000 years since that. We are living in between the 69th and the 70, 70th week of Daniel. There's this gap in between those two periods. We refer to it as the church age. The age of the time from the time that Jesus left to the time that he comes back again. We are living in the age of grace. And if you haven't thanked Jesus for that, you need to. There is no better time in world history to be a a follower of God than to be a part of the church age. We are unique in the universe. We are unique in heaven. We are the bride of Christ. How more intimate relationship with God can you possibly have than to be the bride of Christ? Radical. The the age that we live in will come to an end. It will come when Jesus comes and takes his bride out of the world. When he comes and snatches all believers out of this world, an event that we refer to as the rapture, the catching away of the church, then we'll begin at some point after that, this period that we call the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, a time so terrible, so terrible that Jesus said, if it wasn't limited to just seven years, no life would survive. The whole world would be destroyed, he said. God's patience over man's rebellion will not last forever. And if you've repented of your sins and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you should rejoice because you will be spared the judgment that's coming upon this world. And if you're saved, this is one of the main messages for us. And the message I'm going to be just coming back to over and over and over again as we go through this text, as we go through these next many chapters of the book of Revelation, because for most of us, you know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not going to be first-hand witnesses of chapter 6 through 18. You're not going to be here. But you may know somebody who will be. If you know somebody who does not know Jesus Christ, has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're going to have to go through that. 
And so as we, as we study this, one of the things it should do in us is stir up a passion to let others know what's coming, to warn them of that, to encourage them to walk with God. I'm going to rejoice in my relationship with God today. I don't, I don't worry about the wrath to come because Jesus took my wrath on the cross. I don't worry about judgment because Jesus was judged for my sins. I don't worry about any of that stuff. I'm going to rejoice. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to forget that I know people that don't know Jesus yet. And I need to let this, this word, these messages stir me to a passion to share something with them that might help them to escape the coming wrath. And if you aren't saved, you need to repent of your sins. When? Right now. And I better finish right now. Turn it. God is patient. God is very patient, but his patience will not go on forever. The Bible tells us that there is a day coming where he will come back. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do not wait. And brothers and sisters, I would say to you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, now is the day of salvation. Do not wait to share Jesus Christ with someone else because we may not get another chance. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. We do pray, Lord, you stir up in our heart a passion for your people, a passion for those that you know you want to be with you in heaven. And I believe that's everyone. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us a passion to reach out and share just one more time with someone about Jesus Christ, whether they accept it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they do anything with it or not, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is just to tell them about you, to warn them of the danger, to help them to see clearly that your word is true, that there are things in your Bible that are so amazing that, Lord God, we would just choose to believe it. Lord, as we've seen in our own lives, all of us have seen you at work. We've seen your glory. You've seen your grace. We've seen your mercy. We've seen your love over and over again. Let us believe those things we haven't seen yet because of the things we have seen. Help us to believe your word without the buts, that we would just accept your word and live as if we believed your word. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this day, and we give it up to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.